Well, I lose my math here, but about six years ago, before this building was built, before the visitor center opened, uh, the friends in the Park Service had an idea to start doing some of these programs. And it was, uh, they, this is the learning center. Uh, that year the program was the learning center without walls. We created this big tent out here. It was a brutal Shanksville day. It was 50 degrees, it was September, the, it was raining, the wind was blowing. But they were fascinating programs and they kind of gave us the impetus for this. And one of the, the programs that day uh, was about the media perspective of what it was like to have covered uh, these events. And two of the people who were on the panel were Dennis Roddy and Tim Lambert. So we, we started this Speakers Series program last year. I thought it would be great to recreate that and bring those guys back five or six years after the fact and tell their stories. And when I, and it was one of them, I think it was Tim when I, I said, we want to do this. And he said, will anyone really come to hear us? And, and we were standing outside and, you know, 45 minutes ago and there was no one here. And we said, okay, if no one comes, we'll just go get a beer. <laughs> and then you started lining up. So <laughs> he said, well, now you're going to have to hear it anyway. But, <laughs> but it is, uh, a, you know, I, I think what we find when people come here, um, they enjoy the perspectives of that immediate, the immediacy back then. And I think the one thing those of us who try to tell the story uh, struggle with now is reminding everyone of the bewilderment of that day and that week and that month. Now we know so much. So we think we knew more than we did. And these guys were here very early and I think they can take us back to what, the, what that was. Um, start with Tim. Tim is uh, a radio reporter for WITF in Harrisburg. Uh, so he, he covered part of this, but he also has a very unique connection. Um, his family, and he owned part of this land. Uh, the Lamberts owned those hemlock trees down there right before the crash site. He essentially owned part of the crash site. So he has a unique dual connection to what happened here. He was part of one of the landowners who uh, obviously turned over and sold his land to the Park Service and the government to create this memorial. Dennis, uh, a longtime Pittsburgh media member, uh, was a Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reporter in September of 2001, and he led the Post-Gazette's coverage of this huge international event that happened uh, here in Western Pennsylvania. And those pages you may have seen when you came in are, are part of a special section the Post-Gazette did in October 2001, maybe the first bios we ever saw the family of the people who were on the plane from their family members. So I just want to start with you guys. Dennis, maybe uh, we'll, we'll start with you in a, in a question. Take us back to that week. And if you, you take it back to your mindset and you're, you're assigned to cover this story, uh, and, and what was going through your mind? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, 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 should, I should note that when you say I led the coverage, I, I wasn't really, the, uh, the coverage was led by the editors there, and I was one of a number of reporters. The on-the-scene work here, uh, this is one of the great ironies, the on-the-scene work here at the crash site was done by Cindy Lash and Jim O'Toole of our staff. I didn't come to this scene until uh, after I had already uh, traveled to, uh, to New Jersey and New York to, to investigate the hijackers for the special section that you see out there. So there was, there was a, a, I guess, very much in the example of the people aboard that plane, I don't know that there was any one leader. Uh, but what I remember the most about it was uh, <coughs> simply, you know, the, the astonishment that still stays with me. Uh, I was uh, coming to work, uh, my wife and I, uh, uh, worked together to my great fortune and her ill fortune um, and uh, we got off the bus and Nate Kidry one of the photographers came out and uh, said have you heard what happened and I, I said no what's going on he said the plane just landed into the World Trade Center and I re remember saying Nate I, I actually I don't think they land them there um, <laughs> and uh, it came upstairs and I I, I uh, the TVs were all on in the newsroom uh, and uh, I see this plane slam into a building, and I said, "Oh my God, is that the, uh, is that the, is that is that what happened?" And they said, "That's that's a second plane." And I realized then this is we're not dealing with an accident here. I went back to my desk. We started making phone calls. I covered political extremists at the time, um, and uh, as as I as I was working the phone to see if there was any any connection I could dig up, somebody came in and said. Uh, there's a report of a uh, plane crashing out in Somerset County, 
and I looked up at the uh, the editor who said this, Tim McDonough, and I said, you know, and on any other day, that would be our major story, but look what's happening. And then I stopped for a moment and I thought, no, that that just, it just doesn't happen like that. And of course, that's the whole story of 9-11. It doesn't happen like that until it does. Uh, so from there, it was it was a lot of phone calls. It was a lot of developing uh, sources who were able to tell us what was happening. It was also a lot of frustration for Tim and Cindy because, as one FBI agent told me, yeah, here's what seems to be happening. We go out there, we collect uh, you know all of this information. The public information officer comes down and basically you know treats the press dismissively, and then they leak it all to the Washington Post. Uh, which was, which in many respects was was what you're up against uh, in a national story with national agencies and national media. So, uh, having spilled that little bit of resentment, I, I will say this: I knew we were going to get that in. Yeah, uh, a lot of what I did, a lot of what I thought was my job, because I was also a columnist at the time, was to sort of process this. Uh, uh, for myself first so I could somehow deal with this because this, this had happened. I was born and raised in Johnstown. Um, very proud of that. Uh, and frankly, I always expected to drown. Uh, <laughs> and uh, But uh, uh, my wife's family has a cottage, I guess about 20 miles from here, in some, uh, outside Somerset. And I would, uh, once a year, I made a point of sleeping outdoors just to make sure I left myself open, I guess, to being eaten by bears or something. And, and uh, I would lie there at that cottage looking up into the sky, and I could always see the blink and dot of planes tracing the east-west route, the transcontinental route. And I would sometimes think to myself, you know, how strange it, how strange it is, you know, I'm wondering where they're going, what they're doing, what things look like, what they're thinking. And it seemed so odd to have that strange and yet unknown and unknowable connection to people just passing by. And when I heard about Flight 93, I sometimes wondered, could that have been a plane that I, that I saw at one time? You know, uh, we all feel that connection. And here, uh, here now it's permanent. It's in the soil of this place. Tim, uh, your story, somewhat similar, somewhat unique. Uh, you were reported that day in Harrisburg. I'm not going to give, give away too much of it, but uh, you obviously know something's happening. Why don't you pick up the story of you hearing what happened and, and knowing, obviously, that for years your, your family had owned land in some state county. Sure. Uh, so I kind of had in the back of my mind that, you know, this land existed in, in Shanksville here in Stony Creek Township. Um, but. I hadn't been up here since I was a kid after my grandparents passed away, so it was just sort of there that eh, the family owns this and it's there and we'll see it someday, I guess. Um, but on that day, um, I was actually, you know, I worked a, an afternoon shift, so I was sleeping when the World Trade Centers were hit. Um, and uh, a friend of mine called up, and right around that time, I think there was an incident with the Chinese. There was like an, uh, a spy plane had been taken down or boarded or something, and so there was a lot of tension with China, and he calls me up. And it was after the first plane hit, and we didn't know what exactly was going on. And he said, he said, Tim, wake up. He said, we're under attack from China. And I was like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to sleep. And then he called me back, and he was like, get up. I need to talk to you. Something's happening. Another plane hit. And I was, so I got up and, you know, what, what are you talking about? And he told me, I said, I got to go to work. Hung up the phone. And he called my boss, and I couldn't get through because the lines were down. And then finally got through to him, and uh, he just said, get in here, and hung up on me. So I figured, well, they need me. Luckily, the state police were busy that day, so I drove about 85 miles an hour from Gettysburg to Harrisburg in record time, and uh, just went to work that day and trying to figure out what was going on because um, Harrisburg had a s urban search and rescue team that was based there, and that was actually the first out-of-state uh, urban search and rescue team that went into New York City to help with the World Trade Center rescue and recovery effort at that time. So we were sort of at the epicenter of all three sites, in a way, in Harrisburg. And uh, right around 4.30, I still remember this distinctly, 4.30 in the afternoon, I just happened to stop in the newsroom, and there was a national reporter who was at the Shanksville-Lambertsville Road. And I thought, 
Well, Lambertsville. That's near <laughs> Shanksville. And uh, I said, I wonder where that... And they kept saying the plane went down in a reclaimed strip mine. And I was like, that's got to be close to our property. But, you know, work had to get done. We had to get information out to everybody. So I worked until probably 1.30 in the morning. And I finally got to go home. Drove back to Gettysburg. A little slower this time because I was exhausted. And I get home and I have a voicemail from my dad. And on that voicemail, it's always cracks me up because he seems to forget I work as a journalist. He said, I don't know if you've seen the news today. <laughs> but those are our trees. And I was, you know, I looked at the voicemail and what? So I picked up the phone. I said, well, I'm going to wake him up. I don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Called him up. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, he goes, yeah, I know those trees. Those are our trees. What do we do? And I was like, well, I think people are a little busy right now, so we'll just sit back and wait, to the, wait for them to get a hold of us. And, uh, and we did for a whole month. It took a while because we were the only uh, landowners that were not local. So to track us down probably was the end of September. And uh, the Somerset County coroner called me up and said, I'm the Somerset County coroner. I'm in charge of the uh, crash site investigation. And um, I wanted to let you know the property, part of the property involved in this is yours. We had a hard time tracking you down, but I'd like to invite you to come to the site and tour it and, you know, tell you what we're doing to clean it up. At that time, the site had been completely closed off to reporters. As you heard from Dennis, I mean, people weren't even talking to you much about it outside of Wally about what was going on. So I thought, I'm going to have exclusive access to this. Uh, so I said, well, in the in interest of disclosure, Mr. Miller, um, I'm a journalist. And he goes, yeah. And I said, well... I'd like to, you know, bring a camera and a recorder. And he goes, what are you going to do, report on yourself? <laughs> thus, begin, that's, thus begins this relationship with Wally Miller that has spanned to this day. And um, I said, yeah, I think so. But I want to, you know, be open. He said, it's your land. Do what you want. If you want to come out, I'll, I'll talk to you and uh, whatever. So lo and behold, you know, I had this exclusive visit to the site um, in October. And it, I think it was the day before the uh, bombing began in Afghanistan. So. Um, that was my first visit to the to, to this place in probably 15, 20 years. I know uh, both of you guys, through your various reporting, and Tim, because you were land over here, only here, got to meet family members. Um, and there are lots of stories there. But is there a story or two that either of you have? I'll start with you, Dennis, uh, you know, in your reporting that, that really struck you and sticks with you to this day? Um. There, there are two things. One, one that, one that came deeply from my heart, and that was uh, in the course of uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, Forty Lives, One Destiny project with Cindy Lash and Steve Levin and uh, uh, John, Jonathan uh, Silver. Uh, the three reporters, I think, really carried the weight of that because they tracked down the family. I had to track down the hijackers, and we knew where they were, um, yeah, but uh, finding the families and getting them to talk was, was an extraordinary uh, bit of artistry on, on the part of Cindy and Steve and, and Jonathan. Uh, but uh, in, the, in, in the course of going through all of the notes and writing the narrative portion of the story, uh, there was there was a moment when a young woman named Honor Elizabeth Wania, or Liz Wania, as her family was called, um, uh, she was one of the 17 people who made a uh, made a uh, phone call uh, to family. She spoke with her stepmother, and she she uh, you know she, she gave the expected messages that that she. You know, that she sent her love and that she cared about them and, and and you know when you think about all those phone calls on 9-11 all of them were about love I don't think there was a one where anybody mentioned hating anyone um, but um, uh, she said to her I, I just feel bad because it's going to be so much harder for all of you uh, and then she said uh, people are rushing the cab and I have to go and when you think about this, how more conscious an expression of sacrifice can somebody make than to 
uh, basically apologize for the grief uh, that someone else was going to feel while consciously making the decision to end her own life because nobody expected to take that plane over and land it. They were just determined that it not strike its target. I, you know, every time I think of her name, I feel as if I should stand because uh, this was someone whose words are sort of a lasting poetry embedded on this date. I feel so bad because it's going to be harder for all of you. And I have to go now because we're rushing the cabin. The other, the other thing that sticks in my mind was that um, I uh, wound up uh, tracking down uh, the spot where the hijackers had stayed, or at least one of the places they had stayed, uh, receiving some information. And, and I got a call from a French documentary crew uh, led by a guy named Thomas Johnson, who is French. And I called Wally Miller, as a matter of fact, and said, hey, these guys are going to want to talk to you. Uh, he's he's uh, with a French uh, documentary crew. His name is Thomas Johnson. And Wally Miller said, oh, come on. <laughs> and you fell for that? <laughs> it, I refuse to believe there's a Frenchman named Thomas Johnson. But well, turns out he was born in Switzerland and his father was English. But uh, yeah, he was he was he was a French Anglican of all things. And um, we drove at easily 90 miles an hour across Interstate 80 toward New Jersey. I, I swear, at one point they passed police. We stopped at the truck stop in Barkeyville where his companion. Uh, we stopped to grab something from the salad buffet and his companion went walking uneasily across the room with a single pickled egg, set it on the plate, and there was this quick conversation in French and Thomas turns to me and says, he wants to know what it is and what he should do with it. <laughs> <And> <laughs> it's so good to frighten the French. And, uh, and we, we got to New Jersey and just by happenstance and, and expense account, we stayed at the best hotel at Newark International. I think it was a Marriott. And we checked in and then started you know, sort of talking to the staff about what they had heard. And one of them said, oh, they stayed here. Yeah, they got them on videotape. They came in, they rented a bunch of rooms. They rented more rooms than they needed. And they stayed on such and such a floor. It was, it was just an astonishing, it was, it was one of those sheer luck things that, uh, that will occasionally happen to you. And um, it, just, it just struck me walking around there, hearing, hearing you know, they, they ate at the best restaurant in that place. They wined and dined. Basically, they acted like, uh, what came to my mind was the stories I heard from my father's generation, though not from my father. Um, uh, about the kamikaze pilots and the night before their mission uh, they would indulge in every uh, pleasure of the world and every feast and every drunken uh, whatever they wanted uh, uh, you know because uh, the next day they were going to die and uh, I thought God you know, it, you know people don't change their attitude uh, committing acts of war across the generations you know um, you know they partied our people fought. Tim, you had kind of a different uh, connection with some family members? Yeah, I think uh, there, there's three that come to mind, um, and they kind of span a few years. The first one was the first family member I, I met. Um, there was a meeting at the Shanksville School uh, in December of 01 to discuss what was going to happen to the site. Is it going to be a memorial? What does the community want? Is the National Park Service interested? So I drove up here to kind of listen in to see what exactly they were going to do to my land <laughs> and uh, our family's land. And uh, I was out here at twilight and, and Wally's pickup truck pulls up and uh, I saw some people get out and I realized that he had some family members with him. So I wanted to leave and uh, let them have their time alone at the site. Wally of course calls me over and says, I want to introduce you to the Bradshaws. And uh, Sandy Bradshaw was a flight attendant. She was the one who, on one of her phone calls, told her husband that they were boiling water to throw on the terrorists. So, um, 
So I said hello to them, and it was nice to meet meet them, and my, my condolences, and I wanted to get out of there because I wanted to make sure they had their time and they didn't need a landowner like looking over their shoulder. I ran into uh, Sandy's grandmother at Ida's, which is the only place to get food when you're out this far uh, in Shanksville, and uh, and we were talking, and, oh, you're a journalist. And I said, yeah, I'm a journalist, I'm a landowner, I'm not really sure how this whole thing is going to balance out. And she just looked at me and said, tell their story. You know, how do you turn that down? So I decided at that point I was going to tell the story. I was going to tell the story of this site because in all the coverage that was happening after 9-11, it was the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. Nobody paid any attention to this little plot of land here. And I was going to make sure that people remembered that while still maintaining as much journalistic integrity as I could and objectivity. Um, so that was one. And then uh, on the fifth anniversary, as we closed in, it was my birthday is July 28th, a week from today. So you can sing later for me. Um, and Wally calls me up and said, hey, uh, why don't you come to Somerset this weekend? Why do I want to spend my weekend in Somerset, Wally? Like, what what is going on? You know, yeah. Well, you know. So I was younger then. I was you know enjoying life, and um, so he said, "Well, I'm not supposed to tell you, Debbie Borza, who whose uh, daughter was on the plane. She wants to throw a surprise birthday party for you at the Pine Grill." So I, of course, could not turn that down, and uh, we went to the Pine Grill, and and they had a big table set up in the back and there were probably 10 family members there and they all sang happy birthday to me and uh, I still have that tape I haven't played that for anybody that's just for me and uh, so that was a really touching moment for me at that point did you feign surprise yes yes I was this is why you can't trust the media <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much I had no idea when you guys come back here now it's 17 years you were here early. None of this was here. There's a temporary memorial. Um, with nobody here, now all these people are here to, to hear you. W what are your thoughts as you, as you, as you walked in today at, at what this has become and what it means? Now, this place is so special. Um, this always sneaks up on me. I never know what part I'm going to talk about and when it catches me, but. Um, Uh, the site is exactly what we expected it to become. I think we wanted to make sure it kept that that rural quality, that that peaceful quality, um, and and you we let nature regenerate and and be reborn again and heal those scars, the scars of what happened on that dark day. So I think that. To come back and see this and see everybody here who wants to learn the story of Flight 93 and wants to understand what those 40 people did just is the best tribute that we could give to those 40 people. And I think even more so now, and this is not meant to be a political statement in any way, but there were people on that plane from all walks of life, from different countries, they all decided to do something by vote. Even in a time of pure terror, and they knew they probably weren't going to get out of there, what's more democratic than holding a vote to say, we're going to do something? There's somebody from Japan, somebody from Germany, people from across the country of all different ages, income levels, and they decided to do something. So to see the country today square off on every little thing that happens and everyone's got to yell at each other, that lesson's being lost. So I think more people should come here and learn that lesson and remember it when they leave here. Follow that up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, remember how we said we weren't going to prepare remarks? Oh, well, I, oh. Don't, I can't put trust in me. Um, <laughs> Um, there's no table. I can't find my shoe. Um, and there are people out there that would have no understanding what that reference is. Um, I avoided coming to this place uh, after after my one visit uh, uh, up along the fence where, you know, 
the mementos were left and I saw a little note in a child's handwriting that said thank you for saving our lives. Um, uh, the place is still too actively haunted for me. I, I can remember one time uh, my son uh, had some of his friends from, I guess, middle school um, uh, staying at the cabin, so I went as, as, as the useless chaperone. And uh, I said, well, uh, let's go. And they were talking about Flight 93, so I said, come on, let's go. And I had forgotten that the one, one of the boys, his mom is an FBI agent. And he said, oh, yeah, she worked out here on this. And I thought, you know, I'm in it now because uh, I, I would never have thought to take, you know, uh, the child of someone who had an active connection to this place without their consent. And she later contacted us and said she was so grateful because she was, you know, trying to find a way to get her son uh, informed about this story and uh, and what transpired here. Tim talked about, um, you know, about the larger meaning of this, and that, that's something I was thinking about uh, uh, last night. And, and, and what, what I ask myself, you know, what does this say about human nature and about, you know, the American character especially? Uh, and we, we live in an era of top-down governance. And uh, by necessity, so much of the war that was fought over this incident uh, had to be fought in secrecy because uh, covert wars require that. And, and, and the sense of being a participant in a, in a society, a useful citizen in a democracy, uh, is, is something that, that indeed escapes us. And, you know, uh, this, uh, this action, you know, uh, they didn't have really have time to form a consensus. It came with them. It came with them as citizens of this country, as well as citizens of the world. It was already bred into them. It is in every society I've seen, every place I've visited, everyone I've met from around the world, it is bred into us. It is part of our DNA to want to enjoy personal autonomy and liberty. It's just part of human nature. In spite of the governments we might elect, in spite of the regimes that might impose themselves on us. And, you know, without wanting to seem too over the top with it, this place, I think, in many respects, became the Lexington Green of our generation. Now, in years to come, it's going to feel different. Uh, let me tell you, coming out here and seeing all of this, I feel like the last living member of the Army of the Potomac wandering into Gettysburg. Uh, things have changed. It's no longer going to be the place of extraordinarily personal pain. It's, it's, it's the responsibility of this place, these, these folks here, and the National Park Service, not to make it a place of remembrance, but a place of discovery. And, hell, I don't know what else you say about that. Tim, one final thing, and then we'll open up to some audience questions. Uh, it, it took a while for the government, National Park Service, other groups out here to form this memorial. Uh, obviously, they buy all the land all the way out to Route 30 so there could be a buffer zone, uh, both for quiet and so there wouldn't be a McDonald's there. Uh, and there were five or six individual landowners and two corporate landowners of this whole site. And you, there was obviously a, you know, an effort to go through acquiring that. You were right in the middle of it. Uh, you kind of understood it from a historic sense. You wanted to get, uh, obviously, some, some money for your land. Could you just take us through that process a little bit and then what you feel when you come back and see what's become of the land your family owned? How much time do you have? Um, Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was interesting because I had such a good relationship with the family members that it was never really a topic that was broached, um, except when I worked on a story for the fifth anniversary and right after my birthday party, uh, uh, Debbie Borza and Honor Elizabeth Wainio's parents and uh, a couple of other people were down in the middle of the site and we were just standing there talking like we always did. And uh, at one point, you know, they were talking about, my, in five years, we should have this memorial built by now. What's holding it up? Tim. What's happening? And uh, uh, I'm like, uh, nothing. I mean, it, it was literally like we went years without 
having a single negotiation, a single number, a single really discussion. There was all these sort of outside groups that were contacting me. Hey, let's timber your land for X amount of money. Let's do, let me do this, let me do that. Hey, I'm a, I'm a conservation group. I'll pay you X for this. And I was always, you know, in consultation with my dad, always just like, we're gonna wait and see what happens. I owe it to the family members to make sure that the land is protected and that we're treated fairly. Now I worked in Gettysburg for seven years. I covered the National Park Service during some crazy things. Uh, so Park Service personnel, earmuffs. Um, so when they, when they used eminent domain to take the battlefield tower, when they built the new visitor center, uh, so there was a lot that was going on. So up close and personal, I saw basically the book on what to do right and what to do wrong. And I have a great relationship with the Park Service staff in Gettysburg and the Park Service staff here. So, um, but there's still going to be this negotiation at some point. And um, it kind of came to a head when all of a sudden I'm driving home one day and uh, I got a call from an Associated Press reporter who I kept in contact with and he said, hey, uh, are you hearing anything about eminent domain? I said, no, maybe, maybe for one or two landowners who are sort of, you know, publicly being difficult, I guess, but I've been pretty cooperative, but, you know, I, I, well, let me know if you hear something. So I get home that night, I get a certified letter from the, in, the Park Service Regional Office in Philadelphia that says, as of tomorrow, we will be condemning your land under eminent domain. Okay, so I called my lawyer right away, like, what in God's green earth is happening? What is, why is this happening? Nobody knew. So the official line, Park Service people earmuffs, was that we were being difficult in negotiations. From my perspective, there were no negotiations. <laughs> so, um, I did a little bit of offense. I was on CNN and talking about, you know, our perspective and, and that sort of got the people in Washington, uh, they got their attention. So the interior secretary at the time, Salazar, was it Ken Salazar, is that right? So Ken Salazar says, all right, we're gonna go to Somerset for three days, we're gonna negotiate. If there's no deal after three days, that's it, we're taking the land. And, you know, a reporter calls me up, oh, what do you think, what do you about this deal? And I said, I don't need three days, I need three hours. Like, literally, we just need to sit down, we have, you know, what our estimates are, we can, we can work this out. Sure enough, that happened. Um, really amicable deal. Um, the Park Service just wanted to buy the main six acres that were affected by the, the part of the crash site. The other was gonna be the buffer, the 158 that were left. And um, I wanted to donate those six acres. So this turned into another sort of dance. And um, so the Park Service paid me for that land. The families of Flight 93 stepped up and purchased the rest of the 158 acres. I knocked off what the Park Service paid me off of the price tag from the families group, and we had a deal. And uh, I could have not been happier. In fact, I have a paper, the, head, the, the front page of the Daily American when we had a deal. It's the greatest front page I've ever seen in my life because Sid Crosby, Sidney Crosby's lifting the Stanley Cup next to the article about Flight 93 with a pullout quote from me saying, this is a great day for you. So, <laughs> so me and Sid shared the, uh, Sid and I shared the front page of the Daily American. It was awesome. But yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was a matter of being, of, of just being patient. I knew what we wanted, my family wanted for this site. I knew what the families wanted for the site. And we won't, you know, I always said that on September 10th, 20, or 2001, that was our property. On September 11th, 2001, that was the nation's property. And we were just stewards for until we got this deal done. Um, and, you know. What's the total acreage of this? You said there were like four personal yeah. owners and two I said, um, what's the total acreage of this park memorial now? It's over a thousand acres, right? Yeah. It's over a thousand acres. There's 2,200 acres. Oh, okay. oh I, I thought yeah. you wanted no, no. No. 2,200. Only 2,200. You weren't so even close. <laughs> in a million. I said a million. <laughs> <laughs> Then you would have taken over Lambertsville and we couldn't <laughs> let that stand. The only Question? The question is, do the families own the land or does the government? There are 1,500 acres that the National Park Service owns and then the other 700 acres, there's an agreement among those people that hold that property uh, that they still have that property, but there's an agreement with us not to develop the land. 
Yes, sir, back there. Yes, I just want to say something about the, the, the French, the two French guys. You yes. better take this. Um, anyway. Something that's two French guys. I, I, I take that. I think it's the finest documentary I've ever seen. Two brothers that went to the two brothers that went to the uh, firehouse. They came over just to do a documentary on a firehouse in New York City, and they wound up getting caught in everything. It was unbelievable that everybody. I, I don't know if it was ever open to the public to buy, but I recorded it two different occasions, and it's just unbelievable what happened to that day I, I know the with those two guys. I know the documentary you're talking about because it actually caught the plane passing over and slamming into the yep. trade center and that's what journalists are trained to do. Supposed to run Extremely moving. Extremely moving. Maybe one more question. Right here, sir. Here? Yeah. Just stop you mentioned that um, eminent domain was not a factor for you. What about the other landowners? Did they all come to agreement that you know of, or, or did? Um, I think there was one that didn't take. I think there was one that did take it to court, and I think that was settled. And I don't know if they've actually come to a final figure or not, but yeah, they. Uh, yeah, that one went to court. I don't know if it was through eminent domain or just that's how they decided to do the negotiation. They to let the courts decide their, their, their value. Like an arbitration case. Because the families didn't want eminent domain. Nobody did. I mean, nobody wanted to be seen building this magnificent park by having to take the land. Yeah, and the deadline there, folks, is they wanted something for the families here on that 10th anniversary, which was 2011. That's why that meeting was in 2009, because the clock was ticking, and the other memorials were going, and there was still nothing here, and they wanted to get something for the... So I, what you have is the lower part where the wall is down there, that was open on the 10th anniversary. The visitor center and the learning center weren't open until 2014, and now we're going with the Tower of Voices. So this was one that was done incrementally because of funding. It's supposed to be done at once, but but uh, that's that's why we still have this uh, ceremony out here on, on September 9th to dedicate the Tower of Voices, which you, you can still see. And that, that led to some tension with one of the family members who I was really close with, is I had pledged maybe in 2002 to donate that six acres, and he kept saying, we need some progress, like make the donation, and that's where I had to be like, well, if I make the donation, who knows how long it's going to take to sell the 158 acres. I can't do it until it's a package deal, because that could be going on for 15, you know, as long as it took to build this park. So that led to some tension, unfortunately. But, you know, I think it all worked out for the best. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dennis and Tim. Thank you, folks, for coming.